This is day 11 of reading Revelation. Then I saw a beast come out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads blasphemous name. The beast I saw was like a leopard, but it had feet like a bear's, and its mouth was like the mouth of a lion. To it the dragon gave its own power and throne, along with great authority. I saw that one of its heads seemed to have been mortally wounded, but this mortal wound was healed. Fascinated, the whole world followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because it gave its authority to the beast. They also also worshipped the beast and said, Who can compare with the beast, and who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth uttering proud boasts and blasphemies, and it was given authority to act for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling and those who dwell in heaven. It was also allowed to wage war against the holy ones and conquer them, and it was granted authority over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship it, all whose names were not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, which belongs to the Lamb who was slain. Whoever has ears ought to hear these words. Anyone destined for captivity goes into captivity. Anyone destined to be slain by the sword shall be slain by the sword. Such is the faithful endurance of the holy ones. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's, but spoke like a dragon. It wielded all the authority of the first beast in its sight, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound had been healed. It performed great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth with the signs it was allowed to perform in the sight of the first beast, telling them to make an image of the beast who had been wounded by the sword and revived. It was then permitted to breathe life into the beast's image, so that the beast's image could speak and could have anyone who did not worship it put to to death. It forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a stamped image on their right hands or their foreheads, so that no one could buy or sell except one who had the stamped image of the beast's name or the number that stood for its name. Wisdom is needed here. One who understands can calculate the number of the beast, for it is a number that stands for a person. His number is 666. Again, today we open with the chimera. You recall that I said a few weeks ago that a chimera is any mythical creature that's composed of the parts of other beings, other animals, other people. And so it is unnatural. It it can't survive and it certainly cannot reproduce. So a message that we're being given right from the beginning here is that this stooge of evil is only a temporary thing. It, It cannot survive and it can operate only for a limited time. It's worth noticing here that it seems to be that evil likes to make use of cutouts. There's the original evil in the form of the dragon that produces this lackey who does evil's bidding, who has some sort of power in the world. But then that evil being, whatever it is, creates some third one that can be a puppet of sorts and and I guess can be a a distraction or a source of entertainment for people. So there's an awful lot going on here with one being or another acting on behalf of evil. I think it's worth asking why we are so fascinated with these things. Why are we so fascinated with the dictators of the world, the would-be dictators of the world, with the obscenely wealthy of this world, many of whom accumulated their wealth in in ways that are are completely despicable by the the exploitation of people who have nothing, indeed by the death of people who had nothing. It should make us stop and perhaps repent of our tendency, our weakness for making entertainment out of things that are in fact life and death matters and should be taken much more seriously than we do. It's also worth noting that it seems that evil likes to use surrogates. 
as much as we imagine that evil will appear in some frank and open form like it does in a horror movie, in reality, evil seems to leak into the world in dribs and drabs through the actions of those who are merely unethical or merely immoral or merely acting in their own interest when they shouldn't be or are merely acting from a deluded belief that what they're doing is for the good of a group of people or the good of a nation or the good, worst of all, of an idea. We would be much wiser, I think, to be careful to draw a clear line between what merely entertains us and what is, in fact, something that is uh, part of the struggle to bring the kingdom of God fully into the world. And with that, then, we turn to the mark of the beast, this element of revelation that has been the source of so much Hollywood silliness and indeed also so much silliness on the part of a portion of the Christian population down through the ages. There are people who are convinced that anything and everything that is out of their control in some way is the mark of the beast. Getting a COVID shot is the mark of the beast. Having license tags on your car is the mark of the beast. Registering for a business license, getting a passport, the United Nations, the Trilateral Commission, anything and everything is the mark of the beast. So what really is the mark of the beast and how should we recognize it? I, want to, I, don't, I don't want to dismiss the idea entirely, but I want to suggest that it probably varies with what false idol we worship, whether it is our own success or our own beauty, our own sense of security, our own sense of power, our own fear of someone or something else. I think whatever that is, is most likely to be our route to being marked by it in some way. And that then leads us to this idea that you can't engage in commerce without it. Uh, whatever it is that we are marked with tells us who else is similarly marked, tells us who our allies are, and that is how unholy alliances come to be formed. At the same time, I can't help but point out that the mark seems to be involuntary. It says that the, the beast, whatever it is, compels everyone, rich and poor, great and small, to receive the mark. So there's something in it also, perhaps, that is not entirely within our control, something that is something that we fall into in the course of living our lives, perhaps unconsciously or in the course of thinking, well, this is just a little evil that, that I, I, can, I, can, I can account for this, or how much good, how much damage could it possibly do? I think the mark is partly also a mark of the human condition that by our own brokenness as a species, by our own imperfection, our own rebelliousness as people in the largest sense, we are marked in some way as being in rebellion against God. At the same time, through all of these images, particularly the ones that we hear the most about from other Christians, we again need the reminder not to take these things overly literally or to take them overly spiritually. They do speak to us about the actual conditions of our lives, what it is that we do, how it is that we behave, the choices that we make. But at the same time, we shouldn't be going around looking for sixes on other people's foreheads in a literal or even a, a figurative sense. Far better, I think, to be looking for the mark of Christ, the image of Christ with, in everyone that we meet, assuming that it will be there until evidence proves otherwise. Oh, yeah.